So I'd like to ask uh, Phil Lamb to come up on the stage. Phil is one half of Floopy Corporation, a maker of open source consumer electronics. You're adequate at doing things. <laughs> yes, and guessing about how to run a company and business and a few other things. Sure, all right, so I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and main presentation. Well, this is the dangerous part. Okay. Click on that. Just. Okay, so from exp oh, thank you. Um, so from experience, this is the hard part of the talk, right? Where I, this is where I could screw up. Oh, okay. Should I like? I think it's Control F5 that I. Uh oh. Hey, okay, all right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so as, as uh, was mentioned, my name is Phil. And I forgot to take this off. That's my, thank you for coming to my TED talk. Okay, um, so I'm gonna tell you uh, some stories about the open source hardware company I run. We make things, we make consumer electronics. I like to tell people that we make things, we make really great tools for people who use computers all day. And here's some examples, we make headphones, we make trackballs. And I'm gonna tell you three different stories on one and a half X speed because this talk is very short. Um, the first story I'm gonna tell you is about these headphones that you can see on the left here. Um, if you make open source hardware at all, um, you'll, I think, probably have a similar experience to us, which is very quickly you run into the limitations of what it is that people can do. Especially in our case where we make things that we sell in kit form, which means that you have to be able to take it home and assemble it like IKEA furniture. So the relevant part of the statement of principle here is uses readily available components and materials, uh-oh. Standard processes, uh-oh. Open infrastructure, double uh-oh. If you make hardware, there are a lot of things that you can get for secret or in very large quantities that you can't get if you're just, you know, regular Joe. So um, we, as I mentioned, make headphones. We make these from scratch, which was a principles thing, because it turns out that most people that make headphones get their drivers from very large factories. They just buy them off the shelf. And that's because you have to have very expensive and very complicated machinery to make a regular headphone driver. That's obviously out of reach for your average person. And so what we did is something that um, is really strange. Uh, when it comes to headphones, we constructed our own drivers, and we did it using a couple of different materials. We used um, what's called a flex circuit. This is a, it's a kind of PCB that's um, not on fiberglass, it's on, a, it's on a flexible plastic. You can convince a board house to do this for you in small quantities for a relatively low price, which is why we picked this process. To make a headphone driver, you, you typically need a magnet and a coil. So you send some current in the form of an audio signal through the coil, it wiggles inside the magnetic field, and then you get vibrations that you can hear. So this is the first half of a, of a driver. You need the coil, and you need something that wiggles, that's flexible. And you need to suspend it in something that's ideally very light and even more flexible. And typically, the way this is done in industry is people will take very, very thin plastic films. It's not unheard of to get like films that are single-digit microns in thickness. Um, that's obviously, again, not something that people can do in the comfort of their own homes, so we used a polyurethane foam. If you've ever received um, carefully packaged electronics, like chips, um, you'll probably recognize the color of this material. Um, and the way this works is you just kind of glue them together. So you can see the, um, the coil on the left and the foam on the right. If you stick it together and put it inside a plastic frame, and then you put a magnet in the, in the square space, I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see. Um, you put magnets in the square space there, and you have a headphone driver. And this is something that anyone, most people, uh, <laughs> most people can do in, 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 at home and you can create uh, a set of headphones just for yourself. This actually applies uh, to the entire build of materials. This, these are all the pieces that you need to assemble a set of these headphones, and aside from a 3D printer and access to a board house, uh, most of this stuff can be, can be found on Amazon, or um, at the very least with a fixed address and, uh, and, um, and a credit card. So we do this with a lot of our products, actually all of our products, and, um, and I thought I might show you some of the cool things that our um, users do with them, you know, kind of like at the end of the day, why do we bother? Um, these are all kind of things I'm really actually very proud of um, to see out in the wild. Um, so here is an example of uh, a product we released recently. It's a trackball. And um, a lot of the mods that we see out in the wild are people who do cool and fun things with the appearance. Um, this person here has a Prusa XL, and they really went to town. Um, on things that look cooler than the stuff we sell in our shop. Um, and I like that. I actually like the one in the center the most. And you'll, I think, see it again in a minute. Um, this person here uh, took another one of our products and did something magical to it that I don't really understand, but it looks really cool. It looks way cooler than what you know we make, and I'm really proud of that. 
Um, some, <laughs> some things just, you know, they just kind of defy explanation, really. Um, the, the person on the left said that they wanted something that um, was leather. Um, I wasn't really <laughs> sure where they were going with that until they posted a picture. I can't say I enjoy it, but you know, the, 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 po the whole point is that you're supposed to be able to modify it. Uh, the thing on the right didn't come with an explanation at all. I, I still don't really understand this, um, but I do like it. Um, this one is a fun one. This, it's actually, these are all the same product. Um, I left uh, an Easter egg in this one when we designed it. I put a set of bayonet mounts on the bottom because I had kind of a feeling that people would want to do this or maybe that we would want to do this. And I wanted these out in the field from day one. So all of, you know, the pre-order customers and everybody who's gotten one since has these little slots in the bottom of theirs so that if we ever decide to do accessories. It turns out that we were lazier than some of our users because they got to it before, the, before we did and there was a huge discussion about what it is that you did with the sort of back half of your hand, right? Because the, the fingers go in sort of obvious places, um, but nobody knew what to do with their wrists. So somebody came up with a, with a very neat little mod that fits in our little Easter egg here. Um, this person is apparently left-handed and I, oh, I have horror stories about left-handed people. Um, okay, but it turns out in this case, they also had very short fingers. Um, apparently, I didn't see this person's hand, but this is really cool because they added risers to the, to the buttons that sort of fit the use case as well as their u unique um, morphology. It turns out we get a lot of these. Um, there's, I could show you an hour's worth of pictures of people who have made mechanical modifications because of injury, because of just differences and abnormalities in, in their hand geometry, or just, differences in preference. I've seen so many strange desks over the years. Um, this one here, somebody uh, modified our design because they were printing it on a resin printer. Um, we design a lot of our products, uh, all of our products for FDM printing, and it's really efficient to make large internal volumes because the printer will fill them with nothing, essentially. Um, and it'll be really strong. But if you, do, if you use a resin printer, that's not how that works. It turns out it just fills full of resin, which is a waste. So this person spent what I can only surmise is an extremely large amount of time um, poking holes in our design. Um, hey, <laughs> we don't have any resin printers, but if you do, there you have it. Um, <laughs> I promised you another picture. I think we can all agree in this community that um, there is no physical instantiation of a thing that can't benefit from RGB lighting. Um, in this case, it, we actually left another Easter egg on this board. We left LANs for RGB LEDs on the PCB, and this person not only filled them in, they added strips of their own on top. Um, I don't, it, it had to be turned up to 11. I don't know why, I can't explain it to you. It is very cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so we, we actually get contributions not only in hardware, but in software. This is, this is something I'm also really proud of. Um, all of our products run open source firmware or software. Um, but not only that, they actually, all of them, every single one to the last one, runs uh, software that was written by the community for the device. So we went like in circles twice, right? Because we designed it, we designed the product, then we designed the software, it's all open source to begin with, and then somebody came along and put more open source software back into it, and now we actually ship that stuff. And this, this is really cool. I think, I, I think it says something about um, how people are very comfortable with the way we run things, and that makes me very happy and warm and fuzzy inside. So this is an example of a small feature. There are, and this, this just defies explanation for me. I don't understand why people do maintenance work on our code. Just makes no sense to me at all. But this person and a bunch of others have, have spent many, many hours thinking very carefully about the nitty gritty of like how organized this stuff is. And I will, you know, I will say like our code is functional, but I would stop there with the adjectives. <laughs> um, this is fun. This is actually kind of meta. Um, so it, this isn't quite exactly software. So these headphones here, they made, they made their way into the hands of a, of a good friend in Austria who um, put them on his test rig. Um, this person is very talented, a very talented audio engineer. And what they did as a contribution is they produced this, um, which is an EQ correction for the headphones that forms, that changes the way they respond. It changes the, fre the frequency response to make it match what's called a version of the Harman curve, which is um, based on a research fra from a Canadian, hey, hey uh, <laughs> named, named Sean, uh, Sean Olive, who went and asked um, lots and lots of people what the perfect pair of headphones should sound like. So it turns out that if you get our headphones, they are perfect, <laughs> by definition, which is amazing and not our fault at all. It's, the, it's, it's the, this, this magical person that came along and made them much better. 
Um, and I use these every day, and I can, I can say they, they're, they're much better now than they were when it was just us doing it. <laughs> so that's great. Um, the third story I'm going to tell you, um, gosh, I could have talked much more slowly. OK, well, maybe this story will be longer then. So um, we do a lot of our manufacturing in-house. Uh, we run a print farm, which I think is the obvious thing. And then the less obvious thing is we do our own electronics assembly, and we do a bunch of other um, manufacturing in-house. And one of the sort of um, things about being a small manufacturer of stuff, it's sort of a fundamental truth, is that um, you can have small machines that suck, or you can have large machines that are excellent. And there is no, in, like, in, in the quadrant of large and, and small and crappy and great, there is, there, two, of the, two of the boxes are not actually filled in. You cannot have, generally, um, a small machine that is great. And that is a real problem. Um, so we work out of the greater Toronto area, just down the street. Um, and the two things, well, the, the one thing that's really expensive and this, that's relevant to this particular case is space. Like, it's, it's just very expensive to get any sort of space in the GTA. It's like one of the most expensive real estate markets in the world. Yeah, yes. Um, so we are forced to work out of basements, which you can see here. Um, and that means we need excellent machines that are small. And because people don't, you know, not, they're not willing to sell them to you essentially at any price, they just don't exist, we've been forced to do some creative work on that. So there's actually like a, like a whole separate engineering operation inside the company that you don't see because we spend a lot of time thinking about machines. This is an example of a, <laughs> of a machine that looks much worse than it actually is. It's a, it's a reflow oven, um, and it is, it is a fantastically reliable piece of equipment. It's wonderful. Um, and this is what the inside of it looks like. Um, this thing, ha ha like I've had experience working with um, multi-zone reflow ovens, like the cereal kinds that look like you're toasting a bagel. Um, so the, the forbidden bagel machines are, in my experience, much less reliable than this, um, which is kind of cool. But it involves a lot of extra work that we do behind the scenes. Um, another example of this is uh, pick and place machines. So we, um, we started life using uh, somebody else's designs for small pick and place machines. And this is, this is a rabbit hole. Um, uh, <laughs> that's very deep. So it, it, we're actually in the process of commissioning our own machine at the moment. Um, which, if you work at home, comes with its own particular workplace hazards. Um, this is, yeah. Um, but if you look, you know, marauding, <laughs> marauding felines aside, this is kind of what that process looks like when you're, when you're designing your, your own industrial machinery in-house. Um, you not only have to kind of learn an entire branch of engineering, um, you end up dedicating a lot of time and effort and, and stuff to it. Um, I, because this is a room full of um, the kinds of people that would enjoy this, I'm going to... Um, okay, well, that, that didn't go anywhere. Sorry, um, you can't see this video. I, <laughs> I really should have tested all of this on someone else's computer. Um, so it was just a video of the machine moving around, which I find enormously gratifying. Um, and I thought that you might also, but sorry. Anyway, um, that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, I hope you have a great conference.